My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm standing in one of the four years of the Moscow Good News Church. I'm the pastor of this church. And every week, right in this very location, we feed hungry, homeless people. They're so happy to have a good hot meal. And when we sit down and interview them to find out who are they, we find that many of them are former professionals. In fact, many of them have higher levels of education. And yet now, they're in this place where they're just grateful that somebody is giving them a hot meal. What happened to them? How did they stray so far off course that now they don't have a place to live and they're just happy to have a good hot meal? What happened to these people, former professionals, people with real higher education, and now living so destitute? Well, when we talk to them, we find that most of them made a wrong decision at some juncture in their life. And because of that wrong decision, they veered off course with what they ought to be doing, and they just kept drifting and drifting and drifting until finally it had tragic results in their life. It's very serious that you stay on course. When you know what God has asked you to do, don't veer from what He's asked you to do. You need to understand that when you stray off course, it has negative consequences. And if you talk to people who have veered off course from the will of God, they will tell you, don't do it, stay on track. It's a bad situation when you stray from the call of God. What has God told you to do? Do you know what God has told you to do? You can know. God wants to reveal His plan to you. And when He reveals His plan to you, don't make the tragic mistake of veering off course. Stay on track with what God has told you to do. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm going to talk to you about the will of God, the key to your success. And as I told you in the introduction to today's program, it's so important that when you know the will of God, you really stick with it and don't deviate from what God has told you to do. When you're in the will of God, that's where you're going to have power, provision, and protection. But if the will of God goes one direction and you go another direction, probably you're going to have some problems. So it's important for you to know the will of God and actually be in it. Now, the truth is a lot of people know the will of God. They know it but they're not in it. You can know where you're supposed to be and not be there. But when you do what God says to do, and when you get where God tells you to be, power comes, provision comes, divine protection comes. It's amazing what happens when you get where God told you to be and do what God told you to do. How about you? Do you know the will of God? All right, that's good. Are you doing it? Are you actually in the will of God? And by the way, if you don't know the will of God, or maybe you do, but you don't know how to get there, let us pray with you. Call us. Contact us. We're waiting for you. We love to pray with our friends who call us. And I guarantee you that when you call, you will find a friendly voice waiting to put their faith together with you. We are very sincere when it comes to the issue of praying with people who contact us. And I want to remind you that right now I'm offering you my series called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. It's a 15-part series based on these programs. It comes with a tremendous study guide. Oh, the study guide is just amazing. Page after page after page of information. All the points and principles in these programs and all the Greek words. It's all in the study guide and in these 15 programs comes in multiple formats. The back of the series says, do you want to know God's will for your life? To be sure, God has an exact plan for you. That plan is inside you, in your spirit. However, that plan needs to connect with your mind so you'll have the understanding of what to do. In this series, we'll show you how to make that connection. It is just powerful. This would be good for you to use in your personal study or if you're discipling someone, I hope that you are discipling somebody. Or if you're in a Bible study group, this will be tremendous for a Bible study group, and I guarantee it will generate a lot of conversation. I'm also offering you my book by the same title. The book is called 
the will of God, the key to your success, positioning yourself to live, to live in God's supernatural power and protection. The back of the book says, are you ready for a life filled with adventure? If you're seeking to know the will of God for your life, this is the book that will help you find it for your journey of faith. It's important for you to understand that knowing the will of God and actually being in it are two very different things. Many know God's will, but they struggle to comply with what he has revealed. So get ready for an eye-opening undertaking as Rick delves into the journey of key biblical characters as they sought to walk out God's will for their life. It will help you. I love this book. It is just tremendous. And I want you to get a copy of it. But today we're going to jump right back into our teaching. I've got my Bible because everything we do in this program, we base on the Bible. So I would encourage you to get your Bible. And today we're going to begin in Acts chapter 9, reviewing the call of God which came to the Apostle Paul. And when we come to Acts chapter 9, we find Saul, at that time his name was Saul, his conversion on the road to Damascus. He was going to Damascus to persecute and ultimately to exterminate believers. And while he was en route to Damascus, he had a glorious experience where he met Jesus Christ and it totally changed his life. That's what happens when you meet Jesus. It's not just a little adaptation to your life. When Jesus comes in, it brings a radical transformation. That's one way you know that you really get saved. And he found himself in a house where he was waiting for the will of God to be revealed to him for the next phase of his life. And a disciple by the name of Ananias showed up and Ananias prayed for him, prayed for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized him in water. And then Ananias delivered to Saul a prophetic word, and that prophetic word defined God's call for Saul's life. And here's the word. We find it in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. You are a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I'm going to read this again. A chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles before kings and the children of Israel. This was God's prophetic order for Saul or Paul's life. And notice the order, first and foremost, most importantly, above all else, he was called to bear the name of Jesus to the Gentiles, Gentiles. Second on the list, not number one, not the first priority, but second, before kings or before governmental authorities. And third, last of all, least on the list, the lowest priority, he was to bear the name of Jesus to the children of Israel. So let's review again. Number one to Gentiles, number one. That's the most important call on Paul's life. Number two, he's to bear the name of Jesus before kings and governmental authorities. And last on the list, he is to bear the name of Jesus to the children of Israel. But as we've seen, when Paul actually launched out into his apostolic ministry in Acts chapter 13, he reversed the order. He put the Jew first, then he put kings and governmental authorities, and last on the list, he treated it almost as the lowest priority, reaching the Gentiles. This is not what Jesus told him. Jesus said Gentiles first, Jews last. But Paul reversed the order. Why in the world did he do that? How could he confuse what God said so clearly? Have you ever confused something that God said to you? Or maybe you didn't quite like what God said to you, so you adapted it and modified it a little bit? Paul seems to have confused the list of priorities which God gave to him, and he tried to go to the Jew first. But his anointing was not for the Jew first. His favor was not for the Jew first. And because of that, he was met with frustration and disappointing experiences time and time again, nearly beating his head against the wall, trying to reach the Jew, trying to reach the Jew. The Jew did not want to hear what he had to say. But Gentiles who happened to accidentally hear the message, they were begging to hear more. They begged him to stay. Please tell us more. Stay longer. Come back. We want to hear more. Paul had an obvious grace for Gentiles, but that's not what he wanted. 
He wasn't comfortable with Gentiles. He was not raised among Gentiles. He was comfortable with Jews. Now, when you look at the life of Paul, you find there were three primary reasons why he defaulted to the Jew first. And today, I want to cover all three of these, and we've got a lot of territory to cover. He defaulted to the Jews primarily for three reasons. Number one, Paul was a Jew inside and out. Well, we know that because of what he writes in Philippians 3, verse 5. And in Philippians 3, verse 5, Paul says, He was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and as touching the law, he says, I was a Pharisee. Well, let's look at this because this gives us great insight into who he was. And you're going to see he was a Jew inside and out. First of all, he says he was circumcised on the eighth day. Why is that important? That gives us insight into his family. Because only the strictest, most religious Jews circumcised their little boys on the eighth day. This gives us insight into the home that he was raised in. It was a strictly religious Jewish home. Secondly, he says, he was of the stock of Israel. Wow. It's the equivalent of saying, my pedigree is pure. There's no mixture in us. We are pure Israelis. We are pure Hebrew, Hebrews. I'm of the stock of Israel. And actually in this statement, there's a great sense of elitism and pride. Then he says he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Well, the tribe of Benjamin was a favorite tribe. In fact, when the men of Israel would go to war, the last thing they would do before they would fight is they would lift their voices and would shout, for Benjamin. It was the favorite of all the tribes. So now we find when Paul says that he was circumcised on the eighth day, he was from a strictly religious Jewish home. Secondly, he says of the stock of Israel, purebred, this is elitism. He says, my pedigree is absolutely pure. I'm the real deal. Then he says, not only that, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. That doesn't get much better than this. Then he says, a Hebrew of the Hebrews which means he was raised in a Hebrew home to speak the Hebrew language. Everything in his home was Jewish. It was Hebrew. They observed all the customs, all the rituals. And then he says, religiously concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the strictest, most religious group in the land of Israel. This was the equivalent of Paul saying, religiously, I was at the very top of my denomination. Everything in his life tells us he was a Jew inside and out. But God called him to reach the Gentile world. That was a huge leap for this man who didn't know much about the Gentile world. It seemed that naturally he was equipped to speak to Jews and to connect with the Jewish world. But there was a tug of war between his spirit and his soul. His spirit was leading him to the Gentiles, but his soul wanted to default to the Jews because that is where he was most comfortable. And this leads us to point number two. The second reason why he defaulted to the Jews was simply he was comfortable with Jews. It took time for him to embrace his call to the Gentiles simply because of the comfort factor. When Paul came into a new city, he immediately gravitated to the synagogue. Why? Because that's where he was comfortable. I told you in the previous program that when I travel the world and I sit in international airports, I often watch what people do. And I've noted that Americans, when they hear someone else speak in English, they gravitate toward that person. They may not even know that person. But because they hear English and it sounds familiar, and they're sitting in an airport filled with foreigners that they cannot understand, they usually walk over and say to the other English speaker, where are you from? Why are you here? There's a natural connection they feel because they hear something that is familiar to them. I experience the same thing when I'm traveling the world and I see someone speaking Russian. I immediately want to go to them because that's a comfort factor for me. Well, when Paul came into pagan Gentile cities, he was very uneasy. This was not an environment that he was familiar with. But when he would see a synagogue or when he would see a Jew, wow, this is something that he could easily relate to. And he gravitated toward the synagogue and toward Jews just like a magnet to metal. 
He was drawn to them. But this is not where God called him to be. Listen to this. Connecting with the Gentile world was new, and new for anybody can be scary and intimidating. Most people don't like change. Well, this was a big change. How about you? Do you like change? Is it possible that you know the will of God, but you've not stepped into it because it represents such a change for you? You need to get over that because you need to be where God has called you to be. You say, well, it's a little scary to me. It's only scary because you're not there. When you finally get there and embrace it, the grace of God will come on you and you will flourish there. You will be amazed what happens to you when you finally get where God has told you to be and when you're doing what God has told you to do. It's just scary because it represents a change. It's really not so scary. When you get there, you're going to be blessed. And that's what happened to Paul. Paul really struggled with getting there to the Gentile world and connecting with them. The Jews represented comfort to him. So he kept going to the Jews, but listen very carefully. Whether or not he felt comfortable with the Gentiles, it was God's will for him to reach them first as his first priority. That doesn't mean that God was not concerned about the Jew. He called Peter to reach the Jew first, but Paul was called in his own ministry to treat the Gentiles as the first priority. Wow. Proverbs 16, verse 3 says, speaking from the Amplified Version, Roll your works upon the Lord, commit and trust them wholly to Him. Now listen to this. He will cause your thoughts to become agreeable to His will, and so shall your plans be established and succeed. When God first calls you, it may seem strange, it may seem scary, but if you really commit yourself to Him, He will cause your thoughts to become agreeable to His will. And when you get in His will, that's when you're really going to succeed. Get there. Do what God has said to do. But number three, the third reason why Paul naturally defaulted to the Jews, the third reason Paul was burdened for the Jews. Of course. In fact, this really is the most significant reason why he defaulted to the Jews. They were his natural people. He loved them. He wanted them to know what he had found out about Jesus Christ. Paul had a revelation of hell. He did not want his natural people to go to hell. These were those who had received the covenants of God. They'd received the law of God, and now they were outside of Christ, and Paul's heart was beating for them to come to Christ. He really wanted them to be saved, and he wanted to be the instrument that God would use to reach them. In fact, when you read what Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, it is amazing. Listen to this. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now, if that's amazing to you, wait until you hear what the Greek means. Look at this. When Paul says he has great heaviness, the word great is the word megas, which in this verse describes something very large, something huge, vast, really speaks of enlargement. The word heaviness is the word lupe. The word lupe describes pain or grief. It depicts shock, devastation, hurt, wound, and grief, something that is painful, sorrowful, filled with anguish, torment, or agony, a deep sorrow in the soul, a sorrow so deep that words cannot express it. Wow. If you were going to translate this correctly, here is an RIV of Romans chapter 9, verse 2. I have a hurt so deep, a sorrow so severe, that it's like a sore that never heals or gets better. This is a sickness in my heart for which I find no relief. This is how he's describing his burden for his own Jewish people. But in Romans 9, the verse continues to say, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow. What does that mean, continual sorrow? First of all, the word continual 
is the Greek word which means no pause, no break, something that never ceases, not even for a second. The word sorrow is a Greek word which describes anguish, torment, and all-consuming grief, or a pain that consumes the heart, mind, and emotions. And when you put this all together, this phrase, continual sorrow, would be better translated, I feel a tormenting anguish, an all-consuming sense of pain and grief from which I never get rest, not even for a moment. These are strong words. And in fact, if you put all of this together, an RIV would be translated like this. I have a hurt so deep, a sorrow so severe, that it's like a sword that never heals or gets better. This is a sickness in my heart from which I find no relief. I am tormented constantly with a deep sense of anguish. It's an all-consuming pain and grief from which I never get rest, not even for a moment. He's talking about his burden for his Jewish people. And then he continues, and in verse 3, he makes an amazing statement. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. When Paul says accursed, the Greek word means placed under a curse, appointed to destruction. And RIV of all of this would be translated like this. I have a hurt so deep, a sorrow so severe, that it's like a sore that never heals or gets better. This is a sickness in my heart from which I find no relief. I'm tormented constantly with a deep sense of anguish. It's an all-consuming pain and grief from which I never get rest, not even for a moment. I'm tormented. Then he says, listen to this. If it were possible, of course it's not, but if it were, I would wish that I could be appointed to destruction if it would result in the salvation of my brethren, my kinsmen, the people I share the same genes with, according to the flesh. And you know what's amazing? Paul never said those things about Gentiles. Never. He never said, oh, my heart is broken for the Gentiles. I feel anguish for the Gentiles. He never said that about Gentiles. It's what he felt for the Jew. That was okay. He could pray for them. He could intercede for them. But his call was to the Gentiles. And Paul had to adapt his life to the call of God. And when he did, he prospered, he flourished, the power of God showed up, provision showed up, protection showed up, and that's what will happen when you shift to where God wants you to be. And God wants you to find out where you're supposed to be. And if you need somebody to pray with you, to help you find it, call us, contact us, we'll pray with you. But I'm out of time. I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Have you ever wondered if you were living God's plan for your life? Or maybe you need an answer from heaven for a life-changing decision. You can learn to hear from heaven to know God's plan today with Rick Renner's teaching series and book, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. In this series, Rick answers the hard questions about the often misunderstood subject of hearing God's voice and how you can know His will for your life. The Fundamental Teaching Series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24, and the book can be yours for just $17. When you call or go online today and get The Will of God, you'll learn the importance of hearing God's voice and then deciding to act. Whether you're a mother, grandmother, in business or in school, being able to hear and know God's will for your life is essential to your success. Don't miss this special offer, The Will of God the key to your success. Call now, 1-800-742-5593 or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online right now. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from our Moscow TV studio. And I wanted to say thank you to all of our ministry supporters because of your support that we can do our work, reaching out to the forgotten people. One of our primary works in Moscow is reaching out to the outcasts of society shut-ins, the homeless, the mentally ill, the orphaned, the disabled, street kids, and the incarcerated. Our ministry is involved with each one of these outreaches where we demonstrate care in ways that words alone 
can never do. But there are so many more that still need our help. So many more people battling hunger, poverty, mental illness, so many more orphans and children with special needs that need our help. Would you consider joining us as partners today? Your gifts can lift more people up that society has forgotten. We can't do this work without your financial support. When you give, we are able to take the gospel both to our nearby world and to the ends of the earth. We all have a part to play. Right from your home right now, you can help us help others by becoming our partner in the work by supporting our work financially. Please call 1-800-742-5593 or go online to renner.org to give. Through your support, we can continue to make a huge difference in people's lives. As we close, today I want to read for you again the RIV of Romans chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. Listen to what it says. I have a hurt so deep, a sorrow so severe, that it's like a sword that never heals or gets better. This is a sickness in my heart from which I find no relief. I'm tormented constantly with a deep sense of anguish. It's an all-consuming pain and grief from which I never get rest, not even for a moment. If it were possible, of course it's not, but if it were, I would wish that I could be appointed to destruction if it would result in the salvation of my brethren, my kinsmen, the people I share the same genes with according to the flesh. And of course, Paul was talking about the Jewish people. We see that Paul defaulted to the Jews for three reasons. Number one, he was a Jew inside and out. Number two, he was very comfortable with the Jews. And number three, he had a natural spiritual burden for the Jews because they were his own kinsmen. They were his people. He wanted them to be saved. He didn't want them to be lost eternally and go to hell. But that was not the primary call on his life. That's just amazing to me because these amazing things he said about his burden for the Jew, he never stated about the Gentiles. Paul had to mentally make the decision, you know what? I'm going to go where I don't feel natural. I'm going to embrace where God told me to be. Even if I don't really feel it, I'll feel it when I get there. And when Paul shifted to be where God told him to be, that's when everything changed in his life. That's what will happen for you as well. I'm speaking to you from my series called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success and my book by the same title. Order these, they'll really make a difference in your life. But Father, in Jesus' name, I pray today that my friend will shift to where you want them to be and to do what you've called them to do. And I speak it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me. Remember, Ecclesiastes 8.4, it says where the word of a king is, there's power. It's true. So let God's word release its power in you today, and I'll see you in the next program. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.